We were blessed with um, children's choir and our chancel choir, and, and you got to see Elizabeth. Um, the concert wall, the wall is down so that for the concert this afternoon, and um, it's a kind of a big ordeal to move it back and forth. And we thought you might like to see the console and uh, and a little bit, and uh, um, and that way um, Elizabeth has to stay awake. Um, <laughs> It is her birthday, so I can tease her. Y'all wish her a happy birthday. So um, this is the last week in the Undistracted series, and we have been uh, leaning into the peace and joy and purpose that God has for us by being undistracted. Even as the series ends, hopefully our efforts to fight distraction continue because distraction can lead to destruction. I was driving on Rivoli, and for no uh, obvious reason, my glove box fell open. Uh, And I reached over, just out of habit, I reached over, or out of just response, I reached over and slammed it shut, which was just enough distraction to get one wheel off the road, you know. And I got back on the roads, which was good, because it would have been real embarrassing for me to have to confess that I ended up in the ditch uh, and that I destroyed uh, Lynn and Terry Pope's fence because I got distracted while driving. Um, Distraction happens though, doesn't it? It happens, but it doesn't have to. Uh, it, it's been a good thing to, to talk to people, to hear from, from many of you who, who have made some steps to minimize distraction. People who are reading more scripture, praying daily, making financial adjustments in order to be able to give more to support the work of God through the church. Intentional efforts to be more present with family and friends to to limit the influence of of these things that distract us. I've heard about new exercise routines, commitments to get more sleep and watch less television. People are, are showing up to worship with the focus of refocusing after a week full of distractions. Hopefully we'll keep that up because we don't want to miss any of the peace, joy, or purpose that God desires for us. Distraction can happen to us as individuals, but it can also happen to organizations. It's often called mission drift when it happens to an organization. But when an organization gets distracted, it wastes time and resources and opportunities. But it doesn't happen all at once. Usually it happens sort of, mission drift is sort of like getting nibbled to death by ducks, all right? tiny little bites and you end up making little decisions and then you end up being in a place you never imagined. Because he was tired of seeing American jobs moved overseas, in 1997, Dove Charney started American Apparel. So he started this company and the mission was to make clothes in America in order to save American jobs. Well, eventually he got distracted. And rather than focusing on creating American jobs, his company became known for its sexually charged ads. He became known as the Hugh Hefner of retail. The company went bankrupt in 2015. Ironically, it was bought out of receivership by a Canadian company. It's what happens when we get off mission. We get distracted. The church is not immune to this. Remember Jesus, James and John come to Jesus and say, can we sit one on your right and one on your left? And and Mark and and Mark 10 and Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Instead of staying on mission to serve the least and the lost, they had gotten distracted by power and position and prestige. Remember the day that Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple? Matthew reports that, uh, that, that they, with, a whip, with a whip in John, Matthew says, he says to the disciples, to all those there, this should be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. You see, they were taking advantage of the very people that they were to serve. It wasn't supposed to be about turning a profit. They got distracted. Jesus had to call the disciples back to mission many times. Just before he ascended to God, he he gave them their mission again. It's the scripture verse from Matthew that you find in your bulletin. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. 
He gave them that mission. It's where we get our mission as the United Methodist Church. Our mission, which is uh, printed in your bulletin uh, as paragraph 120. And you go, what paragraph 120 of what? Paragraph 120 of our rule book, the book of discipline. It's the way we organize ourselves. You'll notice paragraph 120 says the mission of the church is to make, Jesus, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our mission, to make disciples of Jesus for the transformation of the world. We get it from that verse, go and make disciples from Jesus' teaching. If you were to read a little further, and I know not many of you stay up at night reading this book. If you have trouble sleeping, I can recommend it. But in paragraph 122, which is printed also in your bulletin because I wanted you to have it, it explains how we are to do this. We proclaim the gospel, seek, welcome, gather persons into the body of Christ. We lead people to commit their lives to God through baptism and profession of faith in Christ. Nurture people in Christian living through worship, sacraments, spiritual disciplines, and other means of grace. Send people into the world to live loving and justly as servants of Christ and continue the mission of seeking, welcoming, and gathering people into the body of Christ. That's our mission and our method very succinctly stated. Very clear. Make disciples. But like all organizations and individuals, we can get distracted. And distraction can lead to destruction. And for, before I go further, I want to say up front that it's not my intent to make anybody uncomfortable. For as long as I can remember, Vineville has been a place where our gay and lesbian members have been welcomed, accepted, and loved. Gay family members and friends have found this to be a safe and welcoming place, and I hope that never changes. Our rule book, the Book of Discipline, allows for full participation in the life of the church of everyone. Gay and lesbian persons can be members of the church. They can serve in leadership roles in our church. There are only two limits prescribed by the book of discipline. We do not do same-sex weddings, and non-celibate gay and lesbian persons may not be ordained. Those are the only two restrictions. There, and that has been and remains to be our position. Nothing has changed. Hear me say that. Nothing has, say that back to me. Nothing has changed. So how does this relate to our undistracted series? Right now, in my opinion, this is the biggest distraction in all of Methodism. Churches are leaving the denomination. And this is the first time I've ever talked about this from the pulpit because uh, we've talked about, you need to know that we've talked about it in administrative council and we've talked about it in trustees and finance and staff parish. Your leaders are aware, but we haven't talked about it here. I haven't. And the reason is, is because I think it's a distraction. It's not our mission. It's not what we are about. I haven't wanted to give it any oxygen. Our time and energy needs to be focused on making disciples, our mission. And for the most part, for the last three or four years, we've been able to do that. Uh, and, but I have to tell you this, I, I'm chair of the conference board of trustees, and I have to deal in that role, I deal with this every day. Uh, pastors, lawyers, lots of lawyers. Pastors, lawyers, local church trustee chairs, they call, text, or email me just about daily. And I don't mind the work. The disappointing thing has been that most of them approach me as if I'm the enemy. Like I'm trying to trick them or like I want to take their church away from them. When Warren Plowden got me this job, I did not know that I was going to become the bad guy. But it has to be done, so I figure it might as well be me. Now, I have had a few conversations with Bible folks from here now and then. But largely, we have stayed focused on making disciples. But another church in Macon is going to be voting this week about whether to stay Methodist. And we have lots of friends. And so the questions have become more frequent. So as I was planning this series back at the end of last year and as we moved into the beginning of this year, I sensed that for the sake of mission clarity that I needed to address this. 
Some of you may be real familiar with all of this. And some of you may have no idea what is he talking about. So I want to give you a little background, a little history. In, in 2019, uh, a way was created for churches to leave the denomination. The official word is disaffiliate. And it was the first time that they were ever given the opportunity to leave the Methodist church and keep their property. Now, the, hear me, don't get this wrong. The United Methodist Church has not changed its position on anything related to human sexuality. We still do not allow our clergy to do same-sex weddings. We don't allow churches to host same-sex weddings. And we, if you're no non-celibate homosexual persons may be ordained. That has not changed. If anyone tells you otherwise, explain to them that they are mistaken. Now, for years, this has been debated and talked about in our general conference. For those of you who are new to Methodism, general conference is our legislative body. It's our Congress. It's the only group, the only group that can speak for the church. General conference is also the only group that can change this book of discipline. So it's the only one who can change. It meets every four years, except in 2020, like everything else, it got postponed due to COVID. So right now we are waiting for the 2020 conference to happen, and it's going to happen next spring in 2024. And 862 delegates from all over the world will meet in Charlotte for that. Remember, it's a world gathering. We are part of a world church. 12.8 million members all over the world. That's why it was so difficult to try to think about having a conference during a, a, a worldwide pandemic. We have access to things that other people don't in other places, and they simply couldn't get here. So we're having to wait to meet. We're part of a global church. You think about, we have 12.8 million members around the world. 6.2 million of them are in the U.S. church. There are 30,543 United Methodist Church in the, churches in the United States. It's a big church. 6.2 million members, 30,543 churches. 46% of our members in the churches in the world are in Africa and in the Philippines. We are a church that is truly global. Delegates that are elected by annual conferences come together and they, they study for two years they get together in a group, they pray, they worship, they study, and then they make decisions about how we will do things as Methodists. In 2012 and 2016, there was, was legislation that proposed changing the language in our Book of Discipline. Both times, it was defeated. In 2019, uh, at a special called session just to deal with this issue, the same thing occurred. A plan that was offered to eliminate the language um, that allowed, that, that disapproved of same sex weddings was defeated. And the current language was maintained by a greater margin. And the only thing that changed was mandatory penalties were put in place. So if a clergy person does a same sex wedding, now there is a mandatory penalty that is in place. And bef before that was not the case. So anybody who says they're leaving the Methodist church because the Methodist church has changed its position is either mistaken or they are intentionally misrepresenting their reason because there's been no change. Now, some say they're leaving because of what's going to happen in the future. Now, I have no idea how they are able to predict the future. I'd really like to borrow their crystal ball. I am not so bold as to, to, to proclaim to know what is going to happen. And I certainly wouldn't propose to lead this church uh, based on a hunch or a guess or a fear. There are some serious reasons to question the idea that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. I mentioned that our church is growing the fastest in Africa, in the Philippines. Those areas are traditionally more traditional than the American delegates. And so they're going to have more delegates because they're growing faster. And it was already defeated by a greater margin. And the makeup of the delegates becoming more traditional, it makes it unlikely that the language would change ever, but certainly not soon. But still, some churches are voting to leave. You may be aware in our community, Liberty and Forest Hills, they voted last year to leave the Methodist church. Martha Bowman will vote this Thursday. Sometimes I get asked, when are we going to vote? I say, we're not. 
Because churches aren't required to vote. There's no requirement. You only vote if you want to leave the United Methodist Church. In South Georgia, there are some churches voting, a lot of churches. But when you look at the number of churches across the country, it's really very small. I told you there were 30,543 churches in America, United Methodist Churches. So 2,000 have voted to leave, and they expect another 1,000 to vote this year. So 3,000 out of 30,500, this is less than 10%. It's really a small number. Of those that have voted to leave, about half, about 1,500, 1,600 of those, have decided that they're going to affiliate with a new denomination called the Global Methodist Church. The other half are going to remain independent or join churches like the Free Will Methodist or the Congregational Methodist or the Nazarenes, all of which are much smaller than the United Methodist Church. So to be clear, not everybody's voting. If you, if everybody's voting. No, they're not. 90% of the United Methodist Church in the United States is not voting. And I think that's because most people realize that this is not our mission. It's a distraction. And even more, it becomes even more clear if, if you know the backstory to how this whole process started. In, in 2019, when the traditional plan won the day, there were clergy and there were churches that said, we can't go back to our place and do ministry in our context if we can't do same-sex weddings. It's going to do harm to the church. And so an, an amendment was offered. It was called the Taylor Amendment. It was offered by someone who supported the traditional plan. And, and that language of the Taylor Amendment became paragraph 2553 in our discipline, which allowed a church a limited right to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. But they gave the reasons, and there are two. And this is important. The two reasons a, con a congregation can vote to leave is for reasons of conscience regarding a change in the requirements and provisions of the book of discipline related to the practice of homosexuality or the ordination or marriage of self-avowed practicing homosexuals as resolved and adopted by the 2019 General Conference. So it was related to what happened in 2019 or, it says, the action or inaction of the annual conference related to these issues. So there are two reasons a congregation can vote. It didn't like what 19 did, and the only thing that changed in 19 was mandatory penalties, and if your annual conference is not keeping the rules. The position of the denomination did not change. In South Georgia, our bishop and our annual conference are keeping the rules. We have a church in Savannah, had, they left us, Asbury Memorial. They, are, they left because they, they felt the need to do same-sex weddings right now. That was who they served. That was their community in Savannah. And so they voted as a matter of conscience. They felt they needed to, and they voted to leave. In my opinion, that's the one church in our annual conference that met the criteria to leave because they wanted to do weddings right now. Churches are talking about we need to own our property or about what might happen in the future. But the only reason to vote, it says, is what happened in 2019. None, none of the other things are acceptable reasons to vote. Some churches have tried to make it about something else, but when they put a ballot in your hand in one of those churches to vote, the ballot says it's a matter of, of conscience related to human sexuality. Doesn't say about owning our property. Doesn't say about what happens in the future. And so if you check yes, and it's not about that one thing, it's a lie. It's no, it's no, it, church, lawyers, you'd call it perjury, right? Saying it's one thing and, and it's not. And how can a church ever represent the one who is truth if it begins based on a lie? To vote for any other reason to leave, any other than the one stated on the ballot, I think is to trade away the ability to ever speak for truth. Now, to try to distract people from all of this, there have been all kinds of ridiculous claims offered. Some folks are, are intent on leaving. They've said, we're going to leave and we're going to take as many people with us. And that's meant that there have been a lot of falsehoods out there. It's really sad. The church reflects the politics of our world. They've said, we're going to change the creeds. Nah. They've said we're going to no longer believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection. Remember last fall, we gave out those copies of the article of religion. 
We passed and encouraged everybody to read that. That was your homework. Remember, we said, and the restrictive rules said, those things can't be changed. They're, they're, the fact is, is that the belief in the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus, and other foundational beliefs, none of that is on the table. I don't know of anybody who wants to change any of it. It's not under attack. That's a distraction. Now, I'm not saying there haven't been people who said things that are, get misconstrued. With 49,000 United Methodist preachers on this planet, the chances that somebody said something dumb are pretty high. All right? I'm just saying. But remember, nobody speaks for the church but who? But general conference. So even if one preacher or a group of preachers says something dumb or something you disagree with, if they're not the general conference, they can't change the path of the church. Somebody, remember, here, came to my office, all worked up. Because a bishop had said he didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, I reminded them, nobody speaks for the church except general conference. If he said that, if he said that, it's just his opinion, even if he's a bishop. And then I also mentioned that in the case they were talking about, other bishops confronted this bishop. He clarified they were satisfied. And then I pointed out this fact, and this is important to know because you'll hear this story. It's been in the community. That was 20 years ago. Bishop Sprague has been retired for, for, for 18 years. This is nothing new. But see, it was circulated like it was a story, like it had just happened. They had no idea that it was an old story, that it had been dealt with 20 years ago. It's a, that's because it was a distraction in order trying to generate fear. Someone pointed out, and this is true, some who want to leave have pointed out that we have bishops who aren't keeping the rules. It's true. Can't deny it. In the Western jurisdiction, there are two bishops in same-sex marriages. As a rule keeper, I can tell you this troubles me. When I was ordained, I was asked, do you know our rules and will you keep them? And to be ordained, you have to say yes to both of those. They were asked the same questions. So as a rule keeper, that bothers me. I know they intend their actions as civil disobedience. They think it's a matter of justice. They understand there could be consequences. Our bishop and some other bishops are working on ways to hold bishops accountable. If you know anything about our history, though, I think you need to know this. It's an ironic twist of history that we're in the situation that we are. You see, we, we, have, we have a bishop who breaks a rule on the West Coast, and we in the South don't like it, and we can't do anything about it. You see, in 1939, when the church was reorganized, it was us Southerners who insisted on the jurisdictional structure and that no jurisdiction could interfere in the affairs of the other jurisdiction. And the reason we insisted on that is we didn't want a Northern bishop putting, pushing integration on the Southern church. And so we got what we wanted 84 years ago, and now that's why we find ourselves in the situation where we can't affect the West and what they do in their context because we didn't want them to be be able to affect us 84 years ago. History shows that ignoring and breaking church rules did not start with this issue. In 1784, the Christmas conference condemned slavery and required all members to to dispossess themselves of slaves or withdraw from the church. There was widespread disobedience in the South. Women were not allowed as delegates to our general conference. But in 1888, the Kansas, Minnesota, Nebraska, Pittsburgh, and Rock River conferences all elected women delegates. In 1870, general conference disapproved the ordination of women. But in 1875, the Kansas conference ordained Pauline Martindale as an elder. Anna Howard Shaw, who's the second woman that graduated from um, Boston School of Theology, where Maddie went, she was ordained by the New York Conference in 1980. In 1984, General Conference rescinded her ordination, said it was out of order, but her church said, we want her back. Don't mess with our preacher. Since 1968, the United Methodist Church has ordained women, and we have ordained women. We have bishops, women bishops. I'm a rule keeper. But I recognize that sometimes it has taken rule breakers to bring change and to bring justice. I'm proud to be a United Methodist. We're not perfect, 
but we do a lot of things well. It's all I've ever known. I was baptized right here by Dr. Frederick Wilson, raised with, by you or with many of you in Sunday school and MYF. It was the staff parish relations committee of this church and then the charge conference of this church that first affirmed my call to ministry. And for 31 years, I have worked as hard as I know how for our church. And that's not going to change because I am resolved. God has not released me from that call and I will remain a United Methodist. All of our appointed staff will remain United Methodist. All of our retirees and extension ministers, all 12 of us, intend to remain United Methodist. Which, that reminds me of another lie that was told about retirees. In response to a United Methodist retiree saying he was staying Methodist, right after he left the room, then the answer was sort of was circulated that the reason he's doing that is to maintain his pension, that he'd lose his pension if he didn't stay, which is a lie. It's not true. Retiree pensions and insurance benefits now in South Georgia are not at risk. But they, they were staying... Our retirees are staying because they believe in the church they've given their life to, and they still believe in it. So that's why we're not voting. We don't want to leave the Methodist church. And even if we did want to leave, we're not willing to lie to do it. That's not who we are. That's not what we're about. It's not our mission. It's a distraction. The work of God here is too important to be distracted, to have another church destroyed. And one is Liberty in South Bibb. They voted to leave our denomination last year. They're still looking for a pastor. A year later, they, they haven't been able to find anybody who will come and be their pastor. And there are others in that same boat. The time and money and energy that this is consuming, I believe, is all exp the expense of mission, ministry, and kingdom work. And God is doing great things in and through this church. So why would we want to mess that up? Why would we put that at risk for a distraction? And I want to say a word about Scripture because some, some have said this is a matter of biblical authority. We at Bible have a high view of Scripture. We encourage you to read the Bible every day. The, the staff, when we preachers and teachers, Sunday school students, are, are, are students of the Word. And we believe the Bible contains everything necessary for salvation. But we're not literalist. We never have been. Methodists have never been fundamentalists. Since 1968, with the ordination of women, when that became standard practice in our denomination and locally since 1985, when Sam Rogers had Helen Henry appointed as the associate pastor, it should have been crystal clear that we are not literalist. We read scripture in relation to the time and the context in which it was written. There are Bible verses that say women should be quiet in church. But we read that as reflecting more the time than the heart of God. For the past nine years, you've been served by very capable female clergy, which is evidence to anybody that walks in the door, we don't take Scripture literally. doesn't mean we don't treat it as, with high regard, but we don't read it literally. We have women who teach Sunday school classes, Sunday school classes with men in it, forbidden in the Scripture. But we read that as having to do more with the time than the heart of God. Since Anne Maria Dominguez, there have been women board chairs at this place. There have been a chair. Our previous board chair was a female. But, but there are churches who will never let a woman teach Sunday school if there are men in the room and who will never let women lead the church because they read Scripture differently. It's a matter of second marriages. I think about that. When I came into the ministry, there were older pastors, retirees, that wouldn't do a second marriage after divorce. They said it was against the discipline when they came in the church and that there are Bible verses about it. It says it's adultery. When I first started the ministry, that was how some people fit. They, I got sort of given a talking to and a finger shaking because I was doing a second wedding. But you know what? I've had the honor of officiating at many of those and they have redeemed, in many cases, broken lives and brought great joy to people. And so I think that has, again, more to do with time and power. There are over 200 verses in the Bible about slavery. Churches in the South, our churches use that to defend owning slaves. Think about Bible verses like Exodus 21.20. 20. 
When a slave owner strikes a male or a female slave with a rod and the slave dies immediately, the owner shall be punished. But if the slave survives a day or two, there's no punishment. For the slave is the owner's property. Now, does anybody think that reveals the heart of God? No, it's about power. It's about how to have power and keep the power. The message was shaped by the context, the time and the place. When claiming the promised land, the, the Israelites, they go in, they kill all the men of Midian. And then they bring back the children and the women as spoils of war. And Moses says, no, in Numbers 31, kill all the married women and kill all the baby boys. And you can keep the girls, the little girls for yourselves. Does anybody think that's the heart of God? I don't think so. I think that reveals what people will do to each other under the, in the name of fear and security. So many passages that, that are clear that they're about a specific time and a specific place. But we read the Bible using the major chords to interpret the minor chord. We view the Bible through the overarching lens of God's love. Some passages are clearly for all time, but some are influences more by the time and the place. And that's why we have to study the scripture rather than just pull it out and throw it at people. We, we have to study and discern and because of that, because of doing that in the Methodist church, we have women clergy. We oppose slavery. We let women teach men, and we let women lead the church, among many other things. Now, there are some Christians, there are some denominations who read the six passages that have to do with same-sex relationships. They read them the same way, as reflecting a time and a, the context rather than the heart of God. They believe that when God said it's not good for humans to be alone, that it applied to all people. Our denomination has not taken that position. But there are Methodists who have. Many churches right now are making this critical decision on what may happen at an unknown time in the future. I want to, I want to say that your leadership has refused to make decisions based on possibilities but has chosen rather to focus on probabilities and on certainty. I'm almost done, Davis. <laughs> if, if there is a decision to make in the future, it will, they will make it. But nothing has changed. And so we've been trying to stay focused on what needs to be done, our mission in ministry. And I refuse to let the rudder of the church that steers God's church be fear. I will not let fear be the rudder that steers God's church. Vimble is working hard to stay focused on the life, words, ministry, teaching of Jesus. That's our mission, make disciples. Remember Jesus' final prayer or his prayer over his disciples, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. Think about those disciples. Yet Matthew, tax collector, he worked for the Romans. You had Simon. He was a zealot. He was working to get the Romans thrown out of the Holy Land. They could not be further apart. And yet they were both in the inner circle of Jesus. And Jesus prayed, Father, make them one. To me, that says there can be unity without uniformity. There can be unity without uniformity. So what do we do? I think we keep making disciples. We keep making disciples for the transformation of the world. We help children, youth, and adults discover the love of God and grow in that. We do mission and ministry as part of God's redemption of the world. It's who we are. It's what we are to be about. It's our mission. And with all that I am, as we have prayed through these last couple of years, I believe that the heart of God longs for the church to stay on mission and to be undistracted. Let's pray. God, we live in a difficult time, but probably everybody who sought to be faithful to you have said, Lord, we live in a difficult time. So just help us to navigate our time. Help us to remain focused on what's most important, not that. Don't let us get distracted. We pray your blessing.
In Jesus' name, amen.